Um, my name is Jessica Audi. I am a member of the Therapeutics Initiative and a family physician on Vancouver Island. Um, I've worked with the TI for about three or four years. And uh, for those of you who don't know us, our goal is uh, for drug therapies to be used wisely in the best interest of patients. And that's based on a thorough understanding of scientific evidence. And we're housed at UBC um, and funded indirectly by the uh, government, um, by the Ministry of Health in BC. And in that way, we're able to remain independent of industry um, and other conflicts of interest. We do a lot of different work and you'll find more on the Therapeutics Initiative website. And um, if you're interested in other uh, speaking sessions, we have our method speaker series coming up on November 30th about the I squared statistic in meta-analysis. And on December 14th, there'll be a best evidence webinar like this one about drug to drug interactions in uh, patients on nermatrovir and ritonavir, also known as Paxlovid, uh, for the treatment of COVID-19. So stay tuned for that. And um, if you weren't aware, if you're a family physician or nurse practitioner in British Columbia, uh, we uh, provide prescribing portraits, which are a tool where we give feedback about prescribing patterns. Uh, family physicians should be receiving this, these in the mail, but if you'd like to sign up online, you can go to our website and do so. And for nurse practitioners, you can stay tuned. We'll also be doing some portraits with dentists um, in 2023. So we're really excited about that. Just before I introduce the speakers, I'd like to acknowledge the lands that we are on. We are actually scattered across the province, um, the country in some cases, and, and even the world. Um, uh, the Therapeutics Initiative is based at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, which is situated on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Uh, today, I'm coming from traditional Snanemoch territory on Vancouver Island. And I think even more important than land acknowledgement with the topic that we're going to be discussing today is acknowledging um, particularly why this is so important. Um, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people have been at the forefront of tackling the climate, climate crisis, <clears throat> and they're disproportionately affected by the changes that we see um, and the effects of global warming. Many Indigenous leaders have um, reinforced the need to take action um, against pollution, um, to adapt to climate change, um, and also to improve the way um, and the degree to which we preserve the natural environment and respect what we are given. And I think um, it's really important to acknowledge that today. I'm delighted in, in that same vein to introduce our speakers today. Dr. Val Stoyanova is a general internist in Victoria and a clinical associate professor at UBC with a master's degree in health professions education. And Dr. Celia Cully is also based in Victoria. She's a clinical pharmacist and pharmacy clinical coordinator for Island Health. Both of them are passionate climate advocates who champion climate conscious prescribing. And um, they're doing amazing work in, uh, in terms of implementing this uh, and educating the masses uh, at the national level. So I'll turn it over to, to um, Dr. Stoynova and, and Dr. Cully to take it away from there. Okay, take it away, uh, Celia. Yeah, so welcome everyone. And thank you so much for taking this hour um, with us to, for us to share um, some information about climate conscious inhaler prescribing. Um, and we're looking forward to some discussion. So we have no industry related financial disclosures. Uh, we do, we have received a small stipend from Cascades, which is creating a sustainable Canadian healthcare system in a climate crisis. This is a not-for-profit organization funded by Environment and Climate Change Canada. Um, we also have received a national innovation grant through the Cascades Network with that support from Environment and Climate Change Canada. Um, and you will note that we are going to um, mitigating some potential bias. We're only published, uh, presenting published trial data and recommendations consistent with the guidelines. Next slide. So by the end of this talk, you will be able to discuss the environmental impact of inhaler therapy, identify three concrete steps you can take to reduce the climate impact of your practice, and know that green care is great care. Next slide. 
So here we are, uh, we are in a climate crisis. And um, next slide. The physical science is consistent. There are increasing evidence. Uh, there's, it's consistent and accumulating that uh, there is an unprecedented degree of warming since the industrial revolution. So as it stands right now, we're just above one degree Celsius for global mean temperature rise. And we're actually um, above 1.5 degrees already for Canada specifically. So unfortunately, we're, we are already locked into a certain amount of warming over the next 20 years, but there still is time, the sooner the better, <laughs> um, to make some positive changes. And we as healthcare providers can actually have quite a bit of impact. Next slide, please. Um, so, you know, we're coming to realize over the last several years or maybe decade now, um, you know, me and my practice, I've really come to realize the profound effects of climate change on health in Canada over the last several years. We have extreme heat events that have led to a massive strain on healthcare services, hospitalizations and mortality. We have wildfires impacting cardiovascular and respiratory health, impacting pregnant women and their fetuses. There's changing patterns of vector-borne diseases, floods and droughts are impacting food security. Um, and there's profound effects on mental health as well, anxiety, depression, and PTSD. Next slide. <clears throat> So 2021 was uh, a pretty challenging year for many reasons. Um, so obviously the pandemic, but also climate change. And here in BC, you know, last year we had um, 619 British Columbia's, uh, Columbians, their lives were taken related to the, the heat dome last summer. Uh, the Litton wildfire destroyed an entire community leading to displacement. And in November, 2021, basically almost I think it's exactly a year ago, we had floods and mudslides that caused human and animal deaths and wiped out critical medical routes and supply chains. Next slide. So we know that climate change is negatively affecting health, um, but unfortunately, it's a, there's a little bit of irony here that healthcare services, including both hospital care and primary care, have a profound carbon footprint. So in Canada, the healthcare sector's emissions are nearly 5% of the Canadian national total. And this is actually on par with the airline industry. And so these emissions related to healthcare services are actually contributing to the global burden of climate change. And interestingly, 25% of these total um, healthcare associated emissions are related to medications. Next slide. So on one hand, this is a tremendous area of carbon generation, but on the other hand, it does represent our biggest opportunity for improvement. This is a nice graph that was developed by the NHS, which detailed exactly where the carbon at the National Health Service in the UK, where is it produced and where is it uh, created? And a lot of it is outpatient prescriptions. Um, so as primary care providers and specialists, we can, a tremendous amount of carbon comes out of the tip of our prescribing pens, and there's a lot that we can do. Among these categories, meter dose inhalers deserve special mention. So meter dose inhalers were initially created back in the 1950s. The first inhaler available was albuterol, which is the old school version of salbutamol. And um, I'm sure people know it comes in this like little canister, this little guy here. Um, and initially when we created it, we entered some CFC propellant into this. So with every squirt or every actuation of the inhaler, medication gets expelled because of this propellant into the lung tissue. Initially, the propellant used was CFC. Over in the 1980s, we realized, you know, there was, a hole in the, there was a hole in the ozone layer and we realized that CFCs played a significant role in that. So in 1987, when we all signed on to the Kyoto Protocol, there was this massive global mobilization of people. Um, and very rapidly, the MDI propellant was changed from CFC to HFA, which is what you see now when you prescribe, you know, salbutamol HFA. HFA is a propellant, the most common of which, HFA-134, is 1,300 times more potent than CO2. So although it is not... Uh, detrimental to the ozone layer, it is still extremely carbon intensive. Back in 1997, we realized climate change is uh, becoming uh, even more of an issue. So we all signed on to the Kyoto Protocol. Canada later withdrew uh, in 2012 for reasons we will not get into in this talk. 
but this led to a boom of inhaler innovation uh, in terms of inhalers that are propellant free. This is where my personal journey with planetary health started. And this is an amazing graph from Cascades. But a, a single meter dose inhaler, um, the currently quoted dose is equivalent to 290 kilometers in a standard gasoline powered vehicle. Um, different sources quote different um, different equivalences, but this is sort of the, uh, the most widely spread one. I'm just gonna take a minute to let that sink in, 290 kilometers. This is uh, equivalent to me driving up to the Nanaimo. That is for one inhaler. On a health authority level, this is excellent data from the NHS. They track to where their carbon comes from and three and a half percent of the entire carbon footprint of the entire national health service of the UK is exclusively meter dose inhalers. Uh, this means every pair of gloves that is tossed, every light bulb that is turned on, every staff commuting to and from hospital, three and a half percent of all that carbon is just one agent, meter dose inhalers. I want to highlight that staff commute is 4%, meter dose inhalers are three and a half percent. Um, I don't know that we can get everybody to bike to work for logistical reasons, but this we, we can make a dent in. This is local data with thanks to uh, our excellent colleague, uh, Daryl Quantz over at the Fraser Health Authority. This is a five-year summary of every inhaler dispensed as an outpatient in the Fraser Health Authority. If you look down here, the national average, there's about um, altogether about 600,000 inhalers dispensed, about two thirds of which are meter dose inhalers. The carbon footprint of these inhalers is 9,822. The carbon footprint of Fraser Health is just under 40,000. Meter dose inhalers are responsible for about a carbon, about a quarter of the carbon emissions of the buildings in Fraser Health, which is unreal. If we convert this in kilometers by car, it is over 39 million kilometers, which in itself is the equivalent of a gasoline powered vehicle driving around the circumference of the earth 979 times for a single agent meter dose inhalers. Worldwide, we know that 800 million inhalers are produced yearly, and this is 2018 data, which corresponds to 13 billion tons of CO2. So as uh, Val was mentioning, around uh, the early 2000s, there was a huge boom in technologies um, as CFCs were banned and with the Kyoto Protocol. So mostly this, there was a boom in uh, dry powder inhaler, uh, which uses that inspiratory force to aerosolize the drug um, as opposed to using a propellant. And then the soft mist inhalers, which has a spring. So when you um, turn the base, a spring is compressed. And when it's released, the compressed spring provides mechanical power to aerosolize the dose, again, instead of using a propellant like we have in meter dose inhalers. So it is, it is a bit overwhelming with the number of devices on the market now, trying to keep them all straight. Um, but it is important to be aware of them all because there may be patient specific factors that make some devices more preferred than others in certain scenarios. So we will talk about shared decision making in a moment here. Next slide. So we've already discussed the carbon footprint of meter dose inhalers, but there are some other issues too. So uh, one of the critical ones relates to that breath control and breath hand coordination that's critical for meter dose inhalers if a spacer isn't used. And so in one study, um, it found that there was a critical handling error. So uh, different errors using inhalers uh, in 44% dose inhaler users compared to 21% for dry powder inhaler uh, users. Another issue relates to the dose counter issues. So the vast majority of these uh, meter dose inhalers do not have dose counters. And there are studies indicating that it can go either way. People can either overestimate how much is left and end up using an MDI when it's actually empty or underestimating. And so patients refilling their MDIs too soon and thus wasting some of their device. Next slide, please. So although there are these downsides to meter dose inhalers, there are 
issues with the other devices as well. So um, certainly being aware of the environmental impacts for all these devices is relevant. We know that climate change is critically important to planetary health, like we've just mentioned, those carbon emissions, global warming effect, that rise in global temperature change. So we, we are very concerned about that. Um, this is an image of the planetary boundaries. This was an evidence-based model published first in 2009 in Nature that demonstrated nine parameters whereby there's an ecological ceiling that's been quantified. Over the last um, you know, 15 years, um, it has been expanded upon and, and refined. Um, but basically, once we know that once we exceed this defined ceiling, we are no longer in a safe operating space and there can be abrupt and dramatic changes in the environment. So we're currently outside uh, operating outside that safe operating space of several of these parameters, including climate change, but there are other ones as well, as you can see in the orangey red color. So MDIs have that substantially higher impact relative to DPIs on climate change. Um, but DPIs do have environmental impacts too, related uh, mostly in the um, manufacturing phase, and it can have negative impacts on some of these other planetary boundaries. So the key take home message here is that MDIs have significant effects on that mean global temperature rise and that ripple effect of health effects on, with climate change. But the other inhalers are not without their harms either. And so stewardly prescribing of all of these devices are essential. Next slide. Which brings us to the practical portion of this talk. How do we actually do this? How do we enact really prescribing of inhalers in the way that is better for the patient and better for the planet? We start with patient selection. When I say patient selection, I mean really focusing on whether my patient actually needs an inhaler or not. This is Canadian data. We know that about a third of patients who are labeled with asthma don't really have asthma objective testing. We also know that about 80% of patients who have a negative spirometry will remain on an inhaler regardless of that test. I think part of this really has to do with managing expectations. When somebody shows up in my office saying, oh, you know, I've been coughing, it's been a week since my infection, this is my asthma acting up. Not really, this is how long people are supposed to cough after a viral infection. We know that the typical duration of post-viral cough is almost three weeks, whereas people's expectation for how long they should cough is only about five days to seven days. If we diagnose somebody with asthma and we label them with a diagnosis that they do not have, we risk missing an alternate diagnosis, labeling someone as sick, which has financial implications, drug side effect implications, coverage issues, and a climate impact, as we all know. This is so important that the BC Choosing Wisely Canada has come up with not one, but two key messages. They recommend not initiating any long-term maintenance inhalers in stable patients with suspected COPD until we have documentation of some kind of airflow obstruction on spirometry. They also recommend not initiating medications for asthma in patients over the age of six. Children under six is a completely different ballgame that we will not address today, mostly because I'm an adult physician and Celia is an adult pharmacist and have been told repeatedly during my pediatrics rotation that children are not small adults. Uh, but in adults, consider not starting an inhaler if you do not have documentation of asthma on spirometry, a medical challenge test, or an exercise challenge test. Once I've determined my patient definitely needs an inhaler, the next question is which inhaler should my patient be on? And at this point, we need to ask ourselves several questions. Firstly, is my patient getting the right drug class? Are they getting the right dose? Are they getting the right delivery mechanism for them? Are they comfortable with changing? And can they afford this prescription? And if not, can I make it more affordable for them? In terms of inhalers, the initial crux of the diagnosis, does my patient have asthma? Does my patient have COPD? Do they have some kind of overlap syndrome? And as an internal medicine specialist, I often see patients uh, with COPD, for instance, who are on inhaled corticosteroid monotherapy, whereas we know that in those patients who are low risk of exacerbation, long-acting muscarinic antagonists are the mainstay of therapy. This is uh, from the 2019 COPD guidelines. When it comes to asthma, in the last three to five years, there have been increasing studies talking about the need for more steroids to get better baseline control. 
So this is the most recent CTS 2021 guideline. And as you can see at the bottom, we previously um, were advocating for SAB or short acting bronchodilators as a first line therapy. Whereas currently we can still do that, but we can also use budinocet for moderate. And there's emerging evidence that this might actually lead to less exacerbations. There was actually just a meta-analysis published a couple of months back that looks at all these trials. Are my patient is my patient getting the right drug? If they have a lot, this is sorry, this is uh, goes to the same point as just the GINA guidelines. But if my patient comes in requesting a refill of their Salbutamol, for instance, the first thing I'm going to do is make sure that they have well-controlled asthma. If my patient keeps on requesting frequent refills of their short-acting bronchodilator, perhaps their asthma is not as well-controlled as we thought. The criteria for what constitutes a well-controlled asthma has become a lot more stringent in the last few years since the 2021 guidelines came out. Now we will only accept the need for reliever medication twice a week or less. This was previously higher. We only accept nine times symptoms less than once a week and they have to be mild. Meaning if my patient uses their Ventolin, sorry, their Salbutamol very often, then the answer is not prescribe more Salbutamol. The answer is put them on a maintenance inhaler or increase their maintenance inhaler dosing. This illustrates that point. One of the challenges I find in prescribing some of the newer agents or the dry powder agents is a lack of familiarity with them. Before I got interested in this line of work, I was really only familiar with um, these four devices when there's nine different types of devices commercially available in Canada. How am I supposed to prescribe or teach my patients how to use an inhaler if I myself don't know how to use them and not familiar with the mechanism? So a good resource that I recommend to familiarize yourself is the lung.ca website and the section on patient education. They've got an excellent series of inhaler use videos that go in detail through the steps on how to use each one of these. So you can look at it yourself and uh, give that to your patient. This is one of my favorite slides. So we know that in Canada, our prescription rates for meter dose inhalers are a little bit um, on par with the UK, actually a little bit worse. We're about uh, 90 or 88 to 90% or so meter dose inhaler driven in terms of our prescriptions Canada wide. However, if we look all the way at some Northern European countries like Sweden and Denmark, they prescribe dry powder inhalers as 90% of their baseline inhalers. Their climate impact is a fraction of ours. And the kicker is that they have got the same rates of asthma, the same rates of severe asthma. They've got the same rates of asthma admissions and hospitalizations. Just because they're using dry powder inhalers predominantly by a large margin does not mean that their asthma care is inferior. In fact, it's just as good. One of the questions I often get asked is, you know, my patient has very poor inspiratory capacity. I'm worried about poor inspiratory capacity. Is this something to consider? And yes, there will be a small subset, about 10 to 12% of patients who will not have the inspiratory capacity necessary to use a dry powder inhaler. Um, but again, this represents a minority. And this is a nice chart of the um, minimal expiratory, minimal inspiratory flow rates necessary. The interesting thing with this study is that actually showed that most patients don't have the correct inspiratory flow rate for meter dose inhalers either, because the majority of patients inhale too quickly to actually get good lung delivery to the tissues that ends up in the back of their throat. This is a big deal. If I change a single patient's maintenance inhaler and rescue inhaler, from a meter dose inhaler to a dry powder inhaler, this is equivalent to saving 425 kilos of CO2 per year, which is the equivalent of having that patient change to a vegan lifestyle. I don't know how many people you have successfully talked into veganism for environmental reasons, but I certainly have not had any. So just to add on to what Val is saying, and we've touched on it a little bit already, but the concept of shared decision-making, there are a number of different devices available. Um, and we definitely need to be including our patients in this dis discussion and decision if we're thinking that an alternative inhaler device may be clinically appropriate for them. So with these different devices, you know, patients may be quite, quite comfortable after 
years, if not decades of being on the same inhaler device. Um, and so feel quite attached um, and you know may not feel comfortable making that switch. So, and then may not feel comfortable or it may just become confused if it is done without their consent um, or frustrated or actually um, studies have shown a decrease in confidence in their prescriber if there's a non-consensual uh, switch. Um, there can also be a worsening um, respiratory uh, rates of exacerbations, increased rescue inhaler use. Um, if patients either don't end up using their new device, use it incorrectly. Um, so really engaging them in that process. Another um, factor is what we have heard in, in the UK is um, there was one study that some patients um, actually decreased compliance when they heard about this issue of uh, the climate impacts of MDIs and actually used their device less because they felt a guilt about using their device because of the climate. And so engaging patients in this discussion, encouraging them to continue on the prescribed therapies um, based on that diagnosis um, so that people don't feel guilty to not enough to not use their medication um, if MDIs are the most appropriate device for that patient. Um, <clears throat> the other factor just to mention here is that dry powder inhalers specifically, um, a vast majority of them contain lactose monohydrate, which is um, the active ingredient is attached to the lactose. And when that inspiratory force um, disrupts that, um, that powder, it, in the vast majority of devices, it does contain lactose to help deliver the drug. Um, so for patients who have severe allergies, there's certain religions that uh, want to avoid milk products um, or certain dietary reasons where patients may not feel comfortable switching to a device with lactose. Um, of note, there are a couple dry, powders inhaler, dry powder inhalers that do not contain lactose. Uh, terbutaline and budesonide dry powder inhalers are the ones that I've determined do not contain lactose. Next slide. So we commonly hear um, concerns about costs. Absolutely. We need to ensure that if we are considering a change for a patient, we factor this in uh, because if patients can't afford their medication, they're either not going to take it or there's, it's going to have some negative implication for that patient. Um, one factor though that, uh, you know, Val and I, when we were looking into this to consider is there's the cost per inhaler device, but when you consider the number of actuations per device, and you calculate the cost per dose, many times, not always, but many times the cost is actually quite similar um, and um, or similar or perhaps even less in some scenarios. So as you can see in the far right column um, of this slide, we have the cost per dose. And if you go down to, for instance, the um, SABA prescriptions, so salbutamol MDI relative to terbutaline DPI, the cost difference per two dose uh, per dose is two cents difference. And um, of note, um, you know, if uh, th these medic both of these medications are regular benefits through the Pharmacare formulary here, here in BC. And so um, for patients who are on income assistance, um, so and, and different, um, so the First Nations plan um, and income assistance, um, these medications are regular benefit and would uh, provide some of that coverage. Uh, next slide. So in terms of what's covered in BC, um, you know, this depends, I'm not sure where everyone's coming from here today, but there is the Pharmacare formulary in terms of regular benefit uh, medications that would be covered under Pharmacare. Uh, we have the salbutamol MDI, terbutaline DPI, all single agent inhaled corticosteroids um, are regular benefits regardless of the device type. And we have the ipitropium meter dose inhaler as a SAMA, and uh, the teotropium respimat as a regular benefit for the LAMA classification. And on the Cascades website, um, Val has worked uh, feverishly on a very uh, valuable reference um, that goes through all these different devices and, um, and has some comparison related to cost. So I do encourage you to check that out. Next slide. In terms of that fourth step, um, looking at that grid, so inhaler usage. So moving on, uh, next slide. In terms of inhaler technique, um, Val already mentioned this, the, the importance of understanding the different devices and supporting your patients to use them correctly. And so it really starts with us as healthcare providers to feel 
comfortable and confident with the different uh, delivery mechanisms on the market so that you can help tailor patient-centered uh, recommendations um, and then support patients to use the inhaler correctly. So I actually have seen a patient that showed me that they, um, how they inhale it and they uh, press the canister over their shoulder. So this is a kind of a joke from uh, you know, a television show, but it does happen in real life that patients are not using their inhaler correctly and thus um, have, there's so many <laughs> reasons that that's inappropriate, um, most importantly, clinically. So reviewing patient's technique, and um, you can also ask your pharmacist or if you have an available respi res respiratory therapist to support um, how to do that. Next slide. <clears throat> Um, and so the last step is the inhaler disposal. So this is a bit of a controversial area. Um, next slide. But we do know, so on this graph here, you'll see um, these four graph, uh, four bars on the right are all meter dose inhalers. And it shows where the carbon emissions are associated with the different phases of their use. So green being the use phase, blue being manufacturing, and purple being end of life. So um, roughly, a quarter to a third of emissions with meter dose inhalers occur in the end of life phase. So after the patient has finished using it, there are greenhouse gas emissions that are still leaking out of that canister and have profound emissions. So we need to advise patients to uh, return, the farm, return their inhalers to the pharmacy for safe disposal. Um, and then they would be ultimately incinerated to uh, degrade that residual propellant. Next slide. Which kind of brings me to a case that I'd like to use to tie what we've discussed together before opening up the floor for questions. Um, Jeremy's a hypothetical gentleman, but I have seen many such Jeremy's in my practice. He is 21. He is a UVic student. He tells me that he had asthma as a kid, but outgrew it, which, as we know, isn't really a thing. Um, and Jeremy just joined the varsity basketball team. On doing so, he realized he's no longer able to keep up with the other players. He tells me he's coughing, tells me he's wheezing. He went to a walk-in clinic and got a blue inhaler and it works really well. He got it about a month ago and he's just coming to see me for a refill. On further questioning, he's been using his inhaler eight to 10 times a day, not only as pre-exercise and including nocturnal symptoms. So does my patient actually need an inhaler? In this case, Jeremy was sent over for spirometry and there is significant reversibility on spirometry, which confirms the diagnosis of asthma. Is he getting the right inhaler at the right dose? Well, he is getting a short acting reliever, but we know that his asthma is poorly controlled according to CTS guidelines. So the answer is not give more salbutamol. The answer is put this gentleman on a maintenance inhaler. So we started budesonide 200, one inhalation twice a day. We reviewed technique. We showed him the lung videos. He learned to rinse his mouth after use to minimize the risk of esophageal candidiasis. We also wrote down on the prescription. This is a new prescription. And can the pharmacist please review technique? Since I have a busy practice, you have a busy practice. We don't always have time to sit down and review to the detail that we would like to. And then before Jeremy left, we told him to bring his inhaler back to the pharmacy and certainly not to chuck it in the trash. So as we wrap up here, um, just wanting to mention that the sustainable healthcare practices related to medications are not just related to inhalers. So, um, you know, we know from the data we've already presented today that the UK, which has done amazing baseline work um, better understanding emissions associated with healthcare, found that pharmaceuticals account for a quarter of healthcare emissions. Um, and in this report, also out of the UK, um, the estimate of um, prescription items that are dispensed from primary care providers that are not necessary is estimated at 10%. So if we can do some rational deprescribing, um, you know, assessing for medications that may, not, may no longer be providing benefit, or may in fact actually be causing harm, can we reassess those and can we reduce the dose or stop them in that plan deprescribing process? And not only is that better for patient care, but that's going to have implications of the supply chain related to medications, medications impacting the environment. So it's not just inhalers, that stewardly uh, prescribing has wide ranging benefits. Um, so I encourage you to, you know, 
think beyond inhalers when you're thinking about that, um, how, how important prescribing practices are uh, for the environment. Next slide. To top it all off, I'd like to close with the words of Dr. Seuss and that unless somebody like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. And inhaler prescribing specifically offers us this amazing opportunity to improve patient care, decrease their climate impact at a financial benefit to both the patient and the government. It's one of those win-win-win areas that we so rarely see and we should really capitalize on it. Thank you for your time. Wow, thank you both. That was wonderful. Um, and I want to give you a few minutes just to have a break uh, before we jump into the questions. I got my copy of the Lorax from the library so I can uh, brush up on the context of that quote. Um, there's been a lot of um, in, uh, interesting things in the, in the chat. There was a couple of questions about, of course, the recording that will be posted on the TI website and on our YouTube channel, which which we need to update um, as well. If it's okay um, with our speakers, we'll post the slides um, on the TI website uh, because I think the idea is to share these really important messages as broadly as we can, because it is such a, it seems like such a small change. And yet I know a lot of patients in my practice would be, if they knew they could do something so simple to help the environment in, in actually a, a, a more, profound way than I ever knew, um, I think they'd be interested. Um, so it's, it's, it seems like a really easy place to start. Um, there were a couple of comments in the chat, just um, if you haven't been able to, to check it out. Uh, Naba Khan, who is a research assistant at Cascades, posted the, the tool that we mentioned about the cost and coverage um, mm -hmm. from the Cascades website. And um, thank you, Naba. Sorry? I said, thank you, Naba. <laughs> oh yeah, that's awesome. And there was a pharmacist earlier on, um, Shaliza, I think, um, who is an inpatient oncology pharmacist at the Ottawa Hospital who posted, if you scroll back, she posted her email address. Um, she's working to build a climate pharmacy nonprofit or climate pharmacy network uh, with other pharmacists. So um, if anyone's interested, they can contact her. Um, so I want to get into the questions now. Hopefully you've had a minute <laughs> and, and clear you through whatever you need to do. Um, first was from Camille. Um, she asked, what is your opinion about single use inhalers like Ellipta, the ones with no refill? Those are something that they have on their formulary. So um, the only inhaler currently available worldwide that has refills are the Spiriva type, um, sorry, the Brespamat type devices. And those are really only available in the UK and Canada. We have no refillable inhalers. And it's true that packaging in plastic has an impact on the environment. But what we do know is that the climate impact of that propellant, the creation, the use and the disposal of it is like outsized many fold compared to the plastic. So I'm I'm with you. I dislike single-use plastic for anything, but it is the lesser of two evils in this case. Very nice. There's another. Oh, sorry. Oh. You want to add? Something? Well, just to add to that, I think this can be an opportunity where we can advocate to industry. I don't know how people feel about that, but you know, I think we do need to, like, within my health authority, advocating to leadership that look at drug procurement. How can we encourage? different uh, manufacturers to create more sustainable products with less packaging. Um, and so leveraging, you know, our advocacy of how can we make the system better? Because I think it'd be great to see more refillable type products um, and, and have them available to us to prescribe and dispense. Thank you. Yeah, it seems there's a whole shift towards in the last 15 years towards a disposable, you know, surgical instrument and all these other places where there's significant waste, but again, probably not as profound as, as, uh, as those <clears throat> things with propellants um, as a part of them. And I know anesthetic gases is another area um, that's a big challenge. Um, there was a comment question from Rob Pamet, um in Prince George. He said, I've seen some evidence that soft mist inhalers are similar in emission equivalents to DPIs. And he'd be interested in your comments on that and followed up um, asking, are soft mist inhalers reasonable alternatives to the PEMDIs? 
Thank you for asking. Um, the climate impact of a soft mist inhaler currently, there's uh, a couple available, there's three available on the Canadian market, and their impact is about six kilometers per car per inhaler device compared to you know, the 290 that we discussed. The challenge with soft mist inhalers is, is that not every single drug class is available. We currently have a long-acting muscarinic antagonist, a long-acting muscarinic antagonist, long-acting beta adrenergic, um, and we also have the, the cell butamol and ipratropium combination. So none of those are really good therapies for asthma because none of them contain any steroids. So in patients who need a long-acting muscarinic antagonist or a lab a combination, then definitely. But if you have a patient with asthma, there's just no good option for them in terms of softness. So consider a DPI. But Thank for you. patients with uh, COPD, you're absolutely right that this would be a very reasonable therapeutic alternative um, for patients when the, when the active ingredients um, are relevant to the disease state especially if their inspiratory capacity is low. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it speaks back to um, making sure the right patient gets the right drug and the right dose and, and the right modality. Um, as Mina, who's a pharmacist in uh, Ontario, she, she reflected, um, you know, I didn't know how much damage these puffers are doing. Do the companies that manufacture these know that? Ooh. Okay, so this is a very loaded question. I'm glad it was asked. Um, the answer is yes, um, in many ways. So we know that some of the pharmaceutical companies have spearheaded these massive greening campaigns. For instance, we know that um, Trilogy in the UK is carbon neutral. So companies have certainly started using it, but the challenge is I, there's no incentive, right? The incentive is you and I choosing to prescribe carbon neutral options where it is appropriate or, or lower carbon option when it is appropriate. And the pharmaceutical industry will follow our lobbying and our prescription practices. Great, thank you. I, you know, I'd say, yeah, it's a big question. <laughs> and I'm sure there's a lot of other um, areas where, where there needs to be more pressure from prescribers and, and patients. Actually, I'd also like to, like to add that right now in the UK, they're developing um, a low carbon version of a propellant instead of HFA-134A, which is the most common one, or HFA-227, which is the second most common one. There's an HFA-152, but it is not currently available on the market in any inhalers. It is, however, being studied. Great, thanks. Um, Shaliza's got her hand up, so... <laughs> See, did you want to uh, talk about your your program? Uh, yeah, no, I just wanted to just add uh, thank you so much um, to, to both speakers. I just wanted to add that in the UK, um, we've seen that the inclusion of the 10 percent within sustainability within contracts. Um, so actually including a percentage within contracts between the manufacturer and um, health systems has allowed for the incentivizing of manufacturers to actually go in that direction. Um, so there is a financial incentive there and um, they've actually been able to create some pretty uh, innovative solutions with regards to um, procurement and sustainability. Uh, but we just need a similar kind of uh, incentivizing type system here. Um, and, and the good news is that we, we have some models that we can, we can kind of follow or at least adapt to the Canadian healthcare system. We just need um, to be able to have that level of advocacy to ensure uh, that we can go in the direction. Thank you. Yeah, and I see uh, in the chat, Suzanne Sullivan was suggesting, you know, we need to raise this issue with our health authorities. The Ministry of Health, um, pharmaceutical steering committees, um, you know, it's uh, it can be considered in their in their decision making process. Yeah, thank you. I thank you, Shliza and Suzanne. Like, I think, you know, I think we need to, you know, the think global, act local. Like, so we consider what's within our circle of control, our circle of influence. How can we have discussions with patients when it's clinically appropriate that there might be an alternative device or deprescribing or whatever the case may be for your patient but then also within different healthcare institutions or, or systems advocating to leadership. And then with the policy, like that high level, um, whether it's provincial government or, or a federal government, you know, how can we, you know, writing a letter or like talking about how this is an important issue and the impacts of, of climate change on health and healthcare system 
I think there still is a lot of work to amplify this message and get it to the right people that are making those policy decisions at a high level. Yeah, it sounds, there's a lot of small things we can do in our practice, even, um, you, you, and at the advocacy, you know, we have to kind of get this at all different levels. And just thinking of my patients when they're hospitalized with exacerbations and they wind up being supplied with a whole new set of puffers and then they go home and I don't know where those puffers go. They often don't accompany the patient and just realizing the incredible waste, um, you know, not only the cost, but uh, the environmental burden. Uh, so I think that's an area that some have a, started looking at in Island Health, but probably needs needs more attention. There's a couple the more people who are looking at it in Island Health have given this talk today. <laughs> um, it's, it's very much our area. So we're spearheading um, the first and largest inpatient climate conscious prescribing initiative, trying to um, trying to mainstream and make sure that there is a continuity between inpatient and outpatient care, which is a huge, huge issue. And addressing that issue of, of waste um, and how we can reduce waste. There's a number of different change ideas and um, we're hoping to release, um, there's already a primary care playbook on sustainable inhaling of practices uh, through Cascades and uh, Val and I are working with Cascades on, on the inpatient practices playbook to support um, improvement in, in their clinical areas. We're getting a few more specific sort of inhaler and, you know, method uh, questions in the chat here. So um, one of the questions was, what about people who are using an inhaler chamber? Uh, what's a good alternative for those patients? So my understanding of the use of an inhaler chamber is that it's to facilitate uh, getting good lung delivery, good medication delivery to the lungs, just because it's so difficult to coordinate the squirt and the inhalation when you're using a meter dose inhaler. So there's no real equivalent when it comes to DPI, but that's just because it's a different technique and a different device. And we do know that DPIs perform generally well in terms of a lower number of critical handling errors. Um, so no real need for a spacer if you're using a DPI. Great, thank you. Um, quite a lot of uh, things here. Next one is from S. Goutrin, I think. Um, uh, do you recommend switching COPD patients on salbutamol MDI for rescue to terbutaline DPI? I was under the impression that terbutaline may not be a good choice for patients with severe COPD due to low inspiratory flow. That is an excellent question. And I think that the word severe COPD is the key. So um, one of the slides you may have missed, but it will be on the recording and it will be in the slide deck, kind of illustrates the different inspiratory capacities needed for different types of inhalers. The minimum you need is about 20 milliliters per minute, which is very, very little. Um, so most patients with COPD will be able to have terbutaline. There will be a small fraction that won't, usually somewhere around 12, 15%. And those patients typically have lower weight are typically female and are typically older. Those are general rules of thumb, but not necessarily predictive ones. So the answer is most people, but not all of them. And that just ties back into that shared decision-making process, determining what's um, you know clinically appropriate for your patient. And yeah, having a very um, customized, tailored approach to determine if an alternative is appropriate for the patient. And if it's not, then you've done, you've done your work uh, because that's, that's that, uh, that process of shared decision-making patient-centered care and ensuring that that patient, if they're aware of this climate issue, that they don't feel guilty um, mm -hmm. because we want them to actually take their therapy for their condition. Um, so trying to um, encourage them that this is the best agent for them and they should be compliant with it. Absolutely. And um, I will say also, going back to an earlier question, we do have the Respimat devices that come with ipratropium and salbutamol, and those need very low inspiratory capacity as well, instead of an MDI. Right. Lots, lots more stuff rolling in. I don't know if we'll get to everything, but we'll try to <clears throat> hit, hit most of them. Um, Connie asked, is there any work being done to add counters onto MDI inhalers for patients that need to use MDIs? None to my knowledge. You. Yeah, I, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I believe there are some devices in different countries that do have dose counters. I am not familiar with any in Canada, but if there's any pharmacists on the line that are aware, I'd be all ears. Um, and I think that, 
you know, this is another way where we could advocate um, to industry to say, we need dose counters to better um, determine what, how many doses are left. But I think they do exist, but I, I've, I've never actually laid my eyes on them myself. And they're not available as far as I know. Okay, a few more, and then we'll have to wrap up. Um, the next one is uh, Katie Gardner. She's wondering if DPI can be used for asthma exacerbation in the acute care setting. Do you think patients can generate adequate peak flow to use the DPI when they're in for a moderate or severe exacerbation? Thank you for asking. It is unlikely they would be able to generate sufficient flow. Um, however, there's a couple of caveats to that. One of them is just to get, to get started on an MDI in hospital does not mean that the MDI needs to be re-prescribed over and over again without questioning that inhaler once they are stable enough to exit. If somebody is sick, then they should definitely be on the best inhaler for them. And if their inspiratory capacity is too low for DPI at one point in time, of course, they need something, you know, forget about the climate impact. That's what the patient needs and that's fine. But that is, again, the minority of MDI prescriptions. The vast majority are outpatient and um, unnecessary. I will also say that we're, Celia and I are currently working on a systematic review of DPI use in the inpatient setting. So that'll hopefully come out in the next few months. Awesome. We'll have to stay tuned. Um, uh, a. Martin asks, are the dry inhalers covered by Pharmacare in BC? The retail pharmacy market is bigger than the hospital market. Thank you for asking. Every single inhaled corticosteroid in BC is covered, every single one, regardless of device. So you can put your asthma patients on budesonide, you can put your asthma patients on a disc, you can put them on any inhaler you wish, they will all be covered. Single um, agent. Sorry? Single agent. Uh, single agent, all single yeah. agent ICS. All um, ICS lab combinations will be special authority, again, regardless of the delivery mechanism. Excellent. Um, Tom asked for a reminder of what cascades refers to, and uh, Nava kindly answered in the chat there. Um, and uh, if you guys want to elaborate on it, that'd be great. But just before you do, I will say some of the, the cascades tools that were mentioned today are included in the pathways resource for uh, family physicians, um, nurse practitioners, and others who use that. So um, if uh, take a look because it should be at your fingertips. Um, I don't know, Celia or Val, if you want to talk more about what Cascades is. Um, just that this is a collaboration with um, the Dalai Lama public. I'm probably not going to, there's like a number of uh, different sec post-secondary institutions that have collaborated with um, Environment and Climate Change Canada. And um, I think checking out the website is probably the most appropriate thing, but my understanding of their goals is to improve awareness and provide tools for healthcare professionals to have more sustainable healthcare practices. Um, and so they have a number of different kind of areas of focus, um, but feel free to have a look at their website. And that, that is the organization through which uh, we do have our national innovation grants to support that playbook for sustainable inpatient inhaler practices, but they do have other initiatives that are ongoing that include primary care as well. Um, so feel free to check out their, their website. So I, sorry, I see that we're out of questions and um, I do know that we have, oh, about four minutes. May I do a share screen again? Yeah, certainly. Although there's one uh, kind of controversial um, comment that you may, <laughs> so why don't you share your screen and I can just bring this up at the same time. Um, this is from Aaron Nenninger. He um, just wanted to encourage people who are really interested to look at the greenhouse gas um, emission source article, which he's referenced there, um, that DPIs do have substantial marine ecotoxicity, um, and that may actually be worse than MDIs on some of the other metrics. So there may be trade-offs to consider. Maybe greenhouse gases are the most important, but plastic use is also an issue. I know that's yeah, probably a lot. But uh, if you wanted to yeah. comment on it, we were waiting sure, for yeah, so, to bring this up. Pardon? We were waiting for somebody to bring this up. Go ahead, see. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I did include that reference on the slide regarding the planetary boundaries because you are absolutely right that um, related to marine eutrophication, uh, that marine ecotoxicity, there are these impacts of dry powder inhalers. And so you are absolutely correct. And that's why I highlighted that all stewardly provided prescribing of all these devices are, are critical. And it's not just switch everyone over and just 
continue on going back to that first step of um, the diagnosis piece, deprescribing where it's clinically appropriate, not initiating when it's not clinically appropriate uh, because there are uh, effects of dry powder inhalers uh, predominantly related to that manufacturing phase related to like those blister packages that are inside the DPIs, the plastic, um, you know, meter dose inhalers also have plastic, also have packaging, but there are downsides for sure. And I hope that, um, you know, I didn't present in detail information from the Jeswani article, but feel free to have a look at that. It's linked in our slides. Um, and, um, and just highlight that our focus has been on the dramatic rise in um, global mean temperature and our focus is on global warming, but not to say that there aren't other issues that should be considered as well. Thank you. Um, Val, I'll give you two minutes so, and this so that I can wrap up after that. So this is a chart. It is posted on the BC Pathways. It is every single commercially available inhaler in BC subdivided by drug type and active ingredient with the number of doses, how much these things actually cost, whether they're covered and what their carbon footprint is. So if you were wondering what to prescribe, feel free to look this up. It will be on pathways. This took many, many hours, uh, but I did it so you don't have to. An amazing amount of work um, and, and this talk today, I hope, I think for some people uh, you're preaching to the choir and it's something that we want to um, see more in our institutions and in our patterns of practice. And for others, it was quite impressive the, the magnitude of impact that these have. So thank you so much to the both of you for sharing all of your hard work and very important messaging with us today. Thank you so much for having us and uh, please feel free to keep in touch. Yes, please, our emails are at the end of the slide. If you are interested in learning more or you wanna collaborate, we are always welcome. Yeah, and uh, there's lots of questions about where to find things. Most of it will be posted on the TI website, the link to the spreadsheet. I'm not 100% sure that that's in Pathways, but I think it is on the Cascades site, correct? Cascades site. Yeah, okay. I have posted a link earlier on in the chat as well. Yeah, and um, maybe we can post that on our website as well, just for, pe for people who are struggling to find it after the fact. Thank you again so much for your time. Um, to everyone who attended, thank you. Um, go forward, spread the word, um, and please fill out your evaluations when you receive them so that you can get uh, CME credit uh, and stay tuned to the TI website for our upcoming webinars on other topics.